Hello and welcome back. So we have been exploring the Laplace transform in order to build a foundation for talking about control theory through the S domain. And today what I want to talk to you about is a really cool connection between reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces and L2 signals. And this connection actually uses a theorem from complex analysis that when I first heard about it, I thought would be completely useless. And this is Morera's theorem. Today what I'm going to show you is that the Laplace transform takes L2 signals over zero to infinity to the Hardy space of the half plane. It also happens to be norm preserving. So why don't we go ahead and start by talking about what a norm is. So now let's talk about function spaces and norms. So we have two function spaces we're dealing with. We have L2 from zero to infinity, which is the space of signals that map the positive real line to complex numbers. That also satisfy when you take the absolute value of the function and you square it and then integrate from zero to infinity, that remains finite. And when you take the square root of that, that is the norm of a function in that space. It turns out that norms give rise to metrics. If I take two signals, f and g, and I take their difference, and I look at the norm of that difference, that gives me a proper metric on L2. And then we have a space of analytic functions that we're gonna be talking about, and this is the Hardy space of the half plane. This consists of those analytic functions where if you take a look at a line parallel to the imaginary axis and you take the square of the magnitude of these analytic functions along that line and integrate from bottom to top, that this integral remains bounded. And if you take the supremum over all of those integrals, this defines a norm on our space. And this gives us yet another metric that we can talk about for the Hardy space of the half plane. Now, what's really interesting is that the Laplace transform connects these L2 signals to analytic functions in the half plane. And so it's easy to find examples where we can transport an L2 signal to the Hardy space of the half plane, or at least an analytic function, we'll verify the rest later. And so for instance, if we take this function, say e to the minus t times sine of 5t or something like that, we can see very quickly that this decays to zero very, very fast. And so this ends up being an L2 signal. And then if we take the Laplace transform of this, we end up with the rational function. And in particular, what we see is that the rational function has all of its poles in the left half of the complex plane, which means it's analytic on the right half plane. And we'll verify that it actually is a function inside of the Hardy space satisfying this norm. And that'll come through the proof of the Paley-Wiener theorem. But to prove that theorem, we have to use a theorem that I never thought would be very useful. And this is Morera's theorem. Excuse me, Gowron. Okay, so this is John B. Conway's functions of one complex variable. And this is where I got my introduction to complex analysis. So going back to page 86, so here we go, Morera's theorem. We're gonna let G be a region, and we're gonna let F map G to the complex plane. And we're gonna let this be a continuous function so that the integral along any triangle is zero for every triangle in this region. Then it turns out that F is analytic in this region. What do we need to verify then in order to use Morera's theorem? Well, first, we're gonna have to show that the Laplace transform of an L2 signal is continuous. And then what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to show that it's analytic by showing that the integral along any triangle is zero. And so we're gonna use these facts in order to prove the Paley-Wiener theorem. So now what we like to show is that if a function is L2 on zero to infinity, then its Laplace transform is going to be at least analytic. So we'll start there. And in order to show that this Laplace transform is analytic, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Morera's theorem. But if we're gonna use Morera's theorem, we need to do two things. First of all, we need to show that one, this Laplace transform is actually continuous. And once we do that, we can then show that it's analytic by showing that the integral along any triangle is zero. So now in order to show continuity, what we're gonna use is the dominated convergence theorem. If you don't remember it, it is written right here. And what it does is it allows us to exchange limits and integrals, which is really handy here because we are showing that a Laplace transform is continuous. So we're gonna take a limit of the Laplace transform evaluated at a sequence of S's. And we would like to show the limit of Laplace transform applied to the sequence when the sequence is converging will actually converge itself. And it'll converge to what the value is at that point. And in order to do this, we need to move a limit to the inside. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that L2 signal over zero to infinity, and we're gonna take this Laplace transform. And we're also gonna pick an S out of the right half of the complex plane. And what we can see is that if we take a look at e to the minus st, and we look at its magnitude, as a complex number, this is actually gonna be bounded by e to the minus the real part of s 
times t. So that is decaying exponentially to zero. And that means that if we take that L2 signal and we multiply it by e to the minus st, this combined signal is actually an L1. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna fix that s in the right half plane. And we're gonna pick a sequence of points that are converging to that s. Now, since s itself is in the right half plane, it isn't on the imaginary axis, so we can find a delta that we can squeeze between that and the real part of s. And since that sequence is actually converging to s, we know that the real part of that sequence is actually going to be closer to the real part of s than delta, uh, because for any neighborhood that you put around s, eventually that sequence is going to be within there. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the Laplace transform on that sequence and compare it to the Laplace transform at s. And if we take the absolute value and we square it, then what we're going to end up getting is we have the absolute value of the integral from zero to infinity of f of t times e to the minus s t minus e to the minus s n t integrated dt, and, and then this quantity squared. And so then what we can do is we can use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, and we can isolate away the L2 norm of that signal, and then we're left with the L2 norm of the difference of these exponentials. And so then what we'd want is we want to take that limit that we have, and we want to show that if we take the limit as n goes to infinity, that that integral is gonna be going to zero. And this is where dominated convergence comes in. So we take a look at that difference of exponentials, and it turns out that you can write this as being bounded by four times e to the minus delta t. And this can be done with say using FOIL or something like that. This is that dominating term out of the dominated convergence theorem, which means that we can move that limit to the inside. And once we move it to the inside, well, we see that that inside term is actually going to zero. And so that means as n goes to infinity, that the difference between the Laplace transforms at s and sn goes to zero. Now we have that the Laplace transform is continuous. And so that is the first requirement that we need to apply Morero's theorem to conclude that it's actually analytic. Now to get that last bit of it being analytic, we need to take an arbitrary triangle in the right half plane. And we need to show that the integral along that triangle is gonna end up being zero. And this is where we can use the fubini tonelli lemma. And if you don't know that, well, it's right here. And what we can do is we can actually exchange the integrals. So if we take the integral along a triangle of the Laplace transform, well, we can change the Laplace transform into another integral. And then we fubinate. And by moving the triangle onto the inside, we end up seeing that the integrals really only applied to an exponential function. But that exponential function is actually entire. And so that means that the integral is zero. And so we have the integral along a triangle that was selected arbitrarily in the right half plane of the Laplace transform is actually zero. Therefore, it is analytic. Okay, so now for our next trick, we're gonna need Planchel's theorem. Now, Planchel's theorem is really about Fourier transforms, and the Laplace transform in this case is gonna be seen as a sort of special case of the, where you look at things a little bit sideways. And in this case, basically what we can see is that the Laplace transform of an L2 signal can be kind of seen as this Fourier transform evaluated at a sort of rotated collection of points. Now, what Planchel's theorem says is that we end up having agreement between the L2 norm of the signal and the L2 norm of its Fourier transform. But now let's be careful about the particular pair that we're talking about. What I'm gonna be doing is I am taking this analytic Laplace transform and I'm restricting it to a vertical line. And so now I am looking at that as our Fourier transform of this L2 signal. So when you use Planchel's theorem here, you end up getting the integral from zero to infinity of the absolute value of our signal squared times some exponential that is less than one. And so then we know that that whole integral has to be less than the L2 norm of our signal. So that means that if we take a look at every vertical line in the right half of the complex plane, then our Laplace transform along that line has an L2 norm that is bounded by the original signal. Now, what we like to do is we like to be able to get some sort of converse. And that is what this Paley-Wiener theorem is all about.